welcome. Um, so, today is like the second lecture, uh, or the first, second lecture of the second phase of the unit. And we're going to do exactly as we did in the first phase, right? When Neil did this really nice introduction, very high level abstract and philosophical about machine learning. And then I took it down to the basics. And now I'm going to try and do the same thing with the very nice lecture that we heard yesterday of putting this in a real practical setting. So even though we're going to be working with a very specific problem, it's important that you try and align this to the bigger things about surrogate modeling that we talked about before or yesterday. So we're going to talk about sequential decision making and Bayesian optimization. And just as in my first lecture, we're going to start in exactly the first place, namely with learning theory. So what we said was that we put up this equation where we said that I have a space of functions or a space of hypotheses, I have some learning algorithm, I have a data space which I can draw samples from, and I got some loss function. And then we said, what would I want to do? Which hypothesis should I pick? Well, I should pick the hypothesis that minimizes the expected loss. Okay, let's now draw this in a slightly different way and look at this problem. And I'm going to use a notation that comes from a paper. This is not the graphical model. That comes from a paper, which I think is probably the best paper of the last 10 years of machine learning, which is Cocaine, Sullivan, Oates, and Girolami, which is called Bayesian Probabilistic Numerics. It's a fantastic paper, a very long read. I think it's 70 pages long. But basically, if we think about the problem that we try to do, so we have a distribution of the data, and then we have some quantity of interest which was defined by our loss function, which was this one specific hypothesis. So now let's say that we're in a regression task. So our quantity of interest is to be able to predict y from x. So then our quantity of interest is some form of conditional distribution of this joint distribution. And then we have an operator, which takes us from this joint to this conditional. So now where we came to with the no free lunch was that this thing here is not available. So this is effectively not machine learning. What we have is that instead we have some sample, some discrete, some finite samples from hopefully this joint distribution. And then what we try to do is that we try to design an algorithm that basically takes us to the same quantity of interest. So now the specific machine learning problems that we have looked at, or the specific algorithms that we have looked at, have been based on models. So what we actually do is this. So what we say is that we have some samples of the data or, or from the joint distribution. And then what we do is that we try and build a model, which is now, could be a surrogate, is one way of thinking about it, of this joint distribution. And then we can do the same conditioning operator to get here. So now let's take this in the context of Gaussian processes. So we have seen this graph plenty of times now. I have some points and now I've fitted this GP, which allows me to get every possible marginal around here. Fantastic, right? So the aim is that this is supposed to actually fit the true distribution of the functions that have generated the data. So now let's think of a slightly different scenario, the scenario that we're going to look at today. So the scenario today is that this set of data that I have is not fixed. It's not given, here's your training data set, do your best. Now the training data can be seen as having been generated by an operator S. So this is the thing that picks points from here, gives me a training data set so that I can apply my algorithm and then I can find my quantity of interest. Now we're gonna look at problems where we are allowed to design both this and this. So let's think about 
the GP setting again. So now we have this point and then we've got this blue uncertainty around here. So we've just talked about this as uncertainty, this belief about something. But actually, you can decompose this uncertainty. And I'm sorry for my use of colors, but this blue thing actually comes from two different things. So there's one thing, which is my uncertainty, the stochasticity in the data itself. So then that's the red thing here. So the red thing here is the noise, effectively, which is what I'm trying to estimate. Then you have this green thing, which adds up together with the red to the blue thing that I showed, which is my model uncertainty. This is the uncertainty of, I actually don't know where my model should go somewhere in between here. So now if I want to build a better and better model, and if I'm allowed to choose which data I could add in to train my model, well, clearly, I shouldn't pick a data point where I've already seen a data point if I manage to estimate this red. So the red I should estimate. I should actually pick something where I have a lot of green uncertainty, such as out here, because here I'm uncertain of the model itself. Now comes, so that's one thing. So the next thing is, dependent on what my quantity of interest is, maybe there's different data that I should pick. There's different uncertainty that I want to reduce. So say, for example, if I'm interested in this specific marginal, well, clearly I shouldn't pick data out here because reducing my model uncertainty out here with the model that I've specified, which has an exponential fall off in covariance, I should actually, with distance, I should actually pick something right in here, right? And that's what we're gonna to use today in order to solve this specific problem. So now you can think about a lot of different problems in the setting that I've set up. So for example, you can think about quadrature rules. So if you have an unknown function and you know you want to compute its integral, so now you can evaluate the integrand, but where should you query it in order to get as good estimate as possible of the integral? You can think about a differential equation. You're running a simulation through a differential equation. How should you pick your step size in order to get as good um, uh, simulation as possible? Or you can think about reinforcement learning now your quantity of interest is a value function that you want to maximize. How should you pick data, i.e. which rollout should you do in order to get as much information as possible about the optimal value function? So these are all tasks that can be thought of in the same way as we're going to think about our specific problem. So what we're going to do specifically is we're going to look at maximize, uh, optimization. So we are going to look at black box optimization, where we want to find the minima of a function which is explicitly unknown. So I don't know what the function is, but I can evaluate the function. To do so, we're going to build a surrogate model. We're going to build a model over this unknown function that decomposes into the belief of what I know about my model and the uncertainty that is inherent in the distribution of the function. And then we are going to design this operator S, which encodes this sequential decision making process. We're going to come up with a strategy of where I should evaluate the function in the best possible manner to reach my object of interest, which is the minima of this function. So, we're going to talk about this through something called Bayesian optimization. So just to set the scene a little bit, we are going to look at minimizations of functions. The function has some form of bounded domain. So I'm going to call the minima of the function x star. So x 
is bounded. And what this means in practice when you code these things is that we always rescale the, the domain to be a hypercube. Then f is explicitly unknown. So I do not know the form of f, but I'm able to evaluate it. f might be noisy. f is most likely very expensive to evaluate. So what is important is that I do as few evaluations as possible of this function. So as an example of thinking about this, um, you can think about doing an election poll, right? So now there's an election coming in a couple of weeks times. And now what I want to do, I want to figure out how people would vote, right? Clearly evaluating this function is really expensive. So I can ask everyone in the US what they will vote, but that's gonna be really, really expensive. So now what I want to do is that I want to evaluate as few people as possible, but they should be as informative as possible so I can get a good estimate of what people will actually vote. So what is, so let's just start with what our baseline would be. So our baseline would be random search, right? To not have a strategy at all. So let's say, just to get an ID, of this. So let's say that I'm looking for a value I'm trying to minimize and my current best is x star and I want to somehow give a guarantee that it's the minima within some value epsilon. Now if I make an assumption of the continuity of the function, so I say it's Lipschitz continuous with a constant c. So this says how quickly the function varies. If I would want to fulfill this guarantee to do random search, that requires me to do c over 2 epsilon to the power d evaluations if my space is d-dimensional. So very, very quickly for even quite small values of c, I get a very, very large number of evaluations. So the idea then is that what we're going to try to do is that we're going to build this surrogate model and we're going to try and optimize this surrogate model instead. So as a surrogate, we are going to use a Gaussian process. The good thing with the GP is that it allows us to specify very, very narrow priors over the function. So if we have some knowledge of the function that we're trying to evaluate, what we can do is that we can encode this knowledge in our prior, and hopefully if we can make this prior as low entropy as possible, then we can have a reasonably efficient search. The second benefit is that it provides a belief over our whole domain. And this is very, very important. Given that I've seen some data, I can compute the marginal everywhere. So let's first look at just how the posterior actually looks when I see some data points. So we're going to throughout this talk use this function. This is called the Forrester function, <coughs> and it's often used in Bayesian optimization uh, for, uh, as an example. So what I have here is that I have the function and then I have this GP prior that I've specified. So now what I'm just going to do is that I'm going to do random search in this. So I start off by adding two points and then I can see how my updated belief looks like. So if I do a random search in this, what you can see, which is the nice thing, is that of course by seeing data somewhere, I'm updating the mean and the variance everywhere, right? That's the benefit of the GP. So now, could we then use the GP itself to design the strategy for how we should query data? Yes. So the first natural thing to do would be to say, well, what about if I add in the minima of the, the, 
the, the marginal that has the expected the, that has the expected value as the minimum. So basically the expected value of each marginal is the mean. So if I evaluate each marginal and I pick the lowest mean along this and I add this in. So if we do that, now I start off again, I have these two points and now at each iteration, I will add in the marginal that has the lowest mean. So now what you can see is that we're gonna take the point to the far left. So I added this. Then I take the point to the far right. And then we keep doing something like this. And now I'm stuck searching here. And I'm stuck searching there because the mean, because I got them these points in this order, this mean here will never go above these points. So if I keep doing this, it's just gonna keep sampling very, very close to the points that I have here. So what I haven't included in this search is that I haven't included the actual uncertainty, right? So what we want to do is to also include the uncertainty in the search in one way or the other. So we need to devise some form of strategy that uses both the mean and the uncertainty for adding data points. So let's now think about how one should do this strategy. And the way I think about it is that my examples, I don't know if, why my examples always end up talking about drinking, maybe that says more about me, but let's say this, a person walks into a bar. So now when you walk into a bar, you have a large possible things that you can drink. So now, if you've never had a drink before, so now you're a human being. A human being is designed to like sugar. So what you can do is you can exploit that knowledge that you have and you can say, can I have the thing that has the highest sugar content behind the bar? Now you're most likely gonna be served a Coke and you can happily drink Coke for the rest of your life and that possibly will lead to certain issues, but you'll be reasonably happy. But you're gonna miss out because if you would have explored a little bit and tried a couple of other things, well, maybe you would have ended with this beautiful Y Valley Bitter. It's a great beer and it's also a great place to ride your bike. So now by doing some exploration, you tried some different things and that actually gave you a better value. But there's also a balance to strike because now you might think, well, actually, I should just randomly try things the whole time. Now, though, you might end up in this case. So smoke salmon flavored vodka is a thing that I hope no one should ever drink. So the key thing here is that in order to devise a strategy is that we want to find a balance between these two concepts. You want to do a certain set of exploitation, which is that you use the knowledge that you currently have. That was what we used in our search with the GP above. We took the knowledge that we have and our knowledge was the mean and we picked the minima of the mean continuously. Now, exploration will be the opposite, or oh, not the opposite, now you will go and test things where you have very little knowledge. And now these two things, you somehow need to balance to decide uh, to come up with a good strategy for how to gain knowledge. And I often think a good example is how you would study for an exam. So now we don't have an exam in this course, but say if we had, it'll be a couple of months from now. So if you would do your best to get the best result on the exam, Right now, it's possibly good to sit on the lectures. It's probably quite good to pick up a book, read, find blog posts, read papers, think about big questions such as Laplace Demon and so forth. So now it's good to do a lot of exploration. But if you're two hours before the exam and you haven't picked up the book yet, well, you just don't, right? Now you should try and do some exploitation instead. Maybe you should try and memorize certain questions from the old exam and so forth. So this 
balancing of these strategies is what we need to think of in terms of coming up with a good way to define this operator S that generates data. So let's look at how the uncertainty can be used in a GP. So if I sample from a GP, now close to the data points, I have knowledge, I have no variance, which means if I sample from it, I get no wiggliness. If I go far away from data where I have variance, I'm gonna have a lot of wiggliness. So if I now do this, if I now take my belief of what I think the model is, and I draw one hypothesis. So this is one hypothesis of what the function actually is, the blue one. And now I look at the minima of that. Maybe this point here is a sensible thing to actually explore. So let's look how these samples actually look like. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to draw samples and I'm going to plot the green point is the minima of that sample. So if I keep doing this, you can see that effectively I get a clustering of data points. Now there's two things to know here. First, you can look at this and say, well, actually, these seems like quite sensible places of actually thinking where the minima is. Now, that's one thing, yeah. So these will be sensible places to actually go and explore. You can also see that these things kind of cluster in an interesting way. And this is one thing that you don't actually see by plotting the variance like this, because the variance plotted like this is just a marginal. Look at what these are. There's one cluster of sample uh, minimas here, one in the middle, and one here. And actually, they all look, the minimas that come here are points, all these functions are points that go down and then bottom out here, and then they wiggle to fit this line. Then, so that's one group of functions. There's another group of functions which says, well, actually to fit this, I should go down and then up and then go down. So I have the same smoothness everywhere. And then there's a last set of points which basically wiggle down and then up to get this. So interestingly, even though it looks like this uncertainty, there's just a big uncertainty here, in terms of the minima, these actually cluster up in this manner. So now we're gonna put some principle behind this. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna formulate a function that says how we are gonna query points. So we're gonna define this operation S as a maximization of a function. And we're going to call this an acquisition function, alpha. And what this function is, is the function that's defined over the same domain as f. It takes the data that I've currently seen so far, and it takes my surrogate model. And what we're going to do is that we're going to say that the maxima of this function is the most, is the point that I'm going to add in to the next iteration. So now this will work well if alpha is much, much cheaper to evaluate than f. If alpha is equally expensive to f, just do f, right? So this here is a proxy. Now we are gonna try and design this function alpha so that it balances these two terms, the exploration and the exploitation. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at four different heuristics or four different ways of defining this function. The first one is called Thomson sampling. And that builds on the principle that we just said before. By drawing samples from the GP, I actually get quite a good idea of where the minima should be because I'm effectively testing my updated hypothesis, and I'm testing, is any, of, is any of these right, right? And then you add them in to get the new belief. Because we're maximizing the acquisition, but minimizing the function, what we're gonna use as an acquisition function is the neg a negative sample of the GP. So let's look at this. So what we have here 
is that I've started off with two points, the red crosses, and then I fitted the GP to that. Then I draw a sample, which is the magenta curve, and then I pick the minimum of that, which is the green. And now the next iteration, I'm going to have added in this x value. And we're going to see how this evolves. So now we add this point in, we add this point in. Now we've got a very interesting sample. So we add a point very close to it and so forth. So now you can see how this one actually ended up finding the minima reasonably quickly. But there's one thing with this Thomson sampling is that it's kind of hard to think about the balance of exploration and exploitation. What I really would want now is that I don't know anything about this region here. Actually, it would be sensible to actually go over and sample over here. Eventually it will, but is there a way that I could get a bit more control over this? And we can do that with a mechanism called upper confidence bound. So this formulates a acquisition function, which looks like this. So it takes the mean and then it takes the variance and it scales these with a parameter called beta. So now there's two ways to get a very high acquisition value either having a very small mean, so exploitation, or having a region with very high variance, exploration. And the parameter beta balances these. So now what I draw here is the acquisition function evaluated over the domain. And now let's walk through an iteration of that. So in this case, we are going to pick a point out here because it has a low mean and it also has a rather large variance. The mean here is slightly higher. The variance is probably the same. So I pick that point. And now you can see that it still retains this bump over here that it says, you know what, it's a sensible thing to pick something out here. but because that point was so high, the mean pushed it up. So it's mainly exploration left here. Over here, I'm currently with, my, with the beta that I've set is the right balance for picking. So now I pick this. Now I get three bumps with each of the regions of the variance. And now eventually I end up picking down here. If I do that a couple of more times, I should hopefully jump over to the other mode. Cool. So that's two different acquisition functions. We can come up with loads of different heuristics of how to define these. And I can possibly try and argue for some of them. But let's try and add some principle to how we can think about them so that we can actually compare them a little bit better. The way to do that is to think about utility. So we can define acquisition functions by first thinking about what would the utility be of observing a specific location. So if I first define this, then my acquisition function would be the expected utility of observing a point. So now what I take is I define the utility and then I say, now I'm going to integrate this utility with the belief I have in the function. So with my surrogate model. So let's look at the first one of these. And this is something called the probability of improvement. So this defines a utility function, which is very, very simple. It says that there is a utility of one to observe something that's better than what I currently have. And the utility of observing something that's worse than I currently have is zero. So now if I would integrate this to get an 
acquisition function, so if I compute the expectation, this is just the probability of oh, this one should be, this sign should be the other way around. It's the probability that the function is smaller than my current best. And this is just the uh, cumulative Gaussian. So effectively what you do is that each point, I'm not sure if you can see my hands, but at each point, each marginal is a Gaussian. And then you integrate from minus infinity up to the current value of that Gaussian slice and then cut it. So this is just the error function effectively. So it's the cumulative Gaussian distribution. So if we look at that, you're gonna see it better. So what you do is that this red point here is my current best. Now I effectively take a slice here. The utility of everything above here is zero. So I take a slice here and I flip that distribution around and I plot it here. So that's now my acquisition function. So if you loop through this, what happens is that now I pick that point. Now you can see that because this was such a high point, all this basically gets pushed up. There's very, very little value of the acquisition function there at the moment. Then I pick this point and eventually I'm gonna narrow down to this mean. And now because I've got so little uh, probability mass here, actually effectively uh, below my current mass, the, the probability of improvement is very, very small. So eventually I found this. So now you can see what this method do, did, it started exploiting very, very quickly due to the structure of this function. And we still have this region here, which we haven't explored. So it goes very, very quickly into a mode of explo uh, exploitation. So one way to address this, and this is probably the most common acquisition function used is something called expected improvement. And it's the one that we're gonna do the worksheet on. And what this one does is that it alters the acquisition function or the utility function slightly. In probability of improvement, our utility of seeing something better was one, independent of how much better we thought it was. So expected improvement changes that and makes the utility relative to how much better we think something could be. So now if you compute the acquisition function of that, you get two terms out. So you get a red term here and the red term is effectively or basically saying, if my mean is lower than my current value, so this is exploitation, then the acquisition gets high. But there's another way of making the acquisition high, and that is the second term, which is I can also have a very high variance in, um, in, in one marginal. So either I think the mean is much better than my current best, or I'm in a region where the variance is high. So let's look at how this one works. So first iteration, you can see that this one now is slightly flatter than the probability of improvement. I'm still gonna add this point over there. Now I add this point in the middle of the large variance region. Now I get the same thing. I get bumps all around where the minima is. And then dunk, 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 eventually it will home in to this point. The difference was that really this step here, in this point here, this term here, the exploration term took over. So now, even though I strongly believe that there is here that you should probably sample in here, this only comes from the red term, the mean, this is exploitation. But now the exploration term came, took over due to this variance and it ended up getting a sample 
Cool. So now, how do we do this in practice? So let's just look at the loop or the algorithm that we actually went through. The, task, the first task is that you encode your knowledge about the function in a GP prior. Then you randomly sample some data. Then you specify the acquisition function that you're going to use. Then you evaluate and maximize this acquisition function. Now you add some new data to the model and you, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, you re-estimate the hyperparameters of your model. So you refit your model and then you loop these two last steps until your budget is gone, when you have to give an answer. And that's effectively how you do BO in practice. So there's this word here, oh, re-estimate the hyperparameters. And it's something that we haven't actually talked about. So if we have a GP, we've specified our prior, the prior has a set of parameters. So in the kernels that we used, it might have a variance term, it might have a length scale, and it might have a noise parameter. So what we do when we fit these is that we maximize the log marginal likelihood of this. So you can do this using gradient-based optimization. You can also do it with BO if you want. That's kind of interesting. Uh, can sometimes be quite useful, actually. So now this might shock you a little bit. So I started off, and me and Neil have been talking about scientific principles and knowledge and all these big things. And then we're basically doing maximum likelihood estimation. And you might have thought that we were some people with some principles, and now we're sounding like some blonde haired politicians who says one thing and does the complete opposite. No, we're not, because we're not doing maximum likelihood estimate. We're actually doing maximum of the marginal likelihood. And I want to show you that this is slightly different just showing you the importance what happens when we integrate out the prior of the GP first and then maximize these parameters. So if we would want to maximize these parameters, these parameters are all part of the covariance function. If I write out what this is, I'm going to get three terms. This term here is completely uninteresting. It's just a constant. But I have two terms left. So I have a red term. And this red term effectively comes from the distance function that sits in the covariance. So this in the likelihood. And this thing here is effectively a data fit term. It basically says, how good is the k that I learned to represent the data that I have? Fine. Then this term is the interesting one. So this term here, I'm going to show you, penalizes the complexity of the functions that I pick. Now, I said in my evidence lecture that complexity is a subjective measure. You should actually define what you mean by complexity. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. So what it means in this case is smoothness of the function. So why does the determinant of the covariance function encode smoothness? Well, let's look at this. So here I have five different covariance functions with a long length scale to a very short length scale. And now if I evaluate the determinant of this, you can see this here has a, it's not zero, but rounding ended up making it very small. The determinant for this one with the shorter length scale is bigger. This one's slightly bigger, slightly bigger. And this one here is close to one. Now, the way I like to think about this is taking the basis function argument. So the log determinant is the sum of the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. The Diagonal element is going to be fixed by the variance of the function. So actually now the question is, how do you spread this variance? Well, in this case, 
Now, this matrix will have an eigenspectrum that's the red one. It will have a few eigenvalues that are very large, which effectively means the most of this variance I can explain in a basis function setting the variations among very many points with a few basis functions because they're very big. They have a long length scale. While for the other extreme, in this case, this covariance is basically white noise. Now the basis function is super, super narrow, which means I cannot explain another function with uh, another margin or another point with another basis function. So that means I get an eigenspectrum that looks like this, which is the magenta. So there is, by doing marginal likelihood, an inherent um, penalization for smoothness in these things. So how do you implement this in practice? If this was 10 years ago, we would have a lecture where we would do derivatives of matrices and all sorts of things. Now we're in the future, and in the future there's auto-differentiation. There's a gazillion number of packages that does auto-differentiation for you. They're very good. They keep coming new ones the whole time. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a vehicle engineer. So you know a lot more about picking the right software for this. Most of my students, most of the people in my group use a package called JAX or a package called TensorFlow. Uh, these are completely different uh, approaches to this problem, but there's benefits to both. There's also a lot of people now using something called Pyro. I'm sure you're able to make your mind up about what to use much better than I am. So have a look at these things to do this. It's very, very simple. So I'm going to do a little bit of a summary, and then I'm going to come back to some of the issues with things that I've said. So the first thing is, GPs are quite cool, right? They're very, very useful surrogates. So doing the search problem that we did, specifying these acquisition functions was very easy, right? Because we have GPs. Then, the second thing is the whole thing we argued for how important it is to have degrees of belief, to go between the fact that I don't know and I know to saying there's a continuum of how much I know something is super useful. If we didn't have this, we couldn't do this, what we've just done, these loops that we've done at all. So what this uncertainty does, what our updated beliefs allows us to do, is to design these rich strategies for how to acquire data. And the factorization of this uncertainty that I said allows us to effectively say, no, here I'm in a region where the uncertainty should just be estimated. And here I'm in a region where I have uncertainty about my model and by being able to factorize these, we can do very, very cool things. So now let's get to some problems. So I showed you this graph and I said, it's really nice that I have this factorization of uncertainty into red and green because the red and green allows me to treat the data space differently. Well, how did the red and green factorization appear? Well, it appeared because I, in this case, made a model specification where I said that this data, the function itself, the noise added to the data that I observe is homoscedastic and it's, a G, uh, it's Gaussian. Because I made that assumption, that led to the green model uncertainty. If I would have made a different assumption about the noise in the data, I would have gotten a different modeling assumption, uh, modeling uncertainty. So therefore, this factorization of uncertainty is in itself a modeling choice. And that makes this really, really tricky. So now, this leads to a question of acquisition functions. So I showed you four, and there's plenty of more, 
which one should I use? Well, really, all of them works equally well if you have the right model. The problem is you never have the right model, which means this factorization here is pretty much never ever true. So now let me show you what this leads to, model misspecification in uh, Bayesian optimization. So this is for a very recent paper, it's used a couple of months ago. Now, here I have a black function. It has some, some discontinuities in this function. It's a deterministic function. There is no noise in the function. So I made a modeling assumption that there is no noise. And this is correct. Now I made a wrong model by not including the discontinuities. So my model says, I believe this is a smooth function. So now look at what happens. So I've seen seven points. These two points come on exactly this discontinuity. So what the model now is gonna say, well, to fit this with a smooth function, I believe the length scale is really, really short because the length scale gets really short when I get, for example, out here, close to this point, I basically say that this point is no longer informative about anything here and I get back to the prior. So that means my acquisition function here is gonna be very, very uninformative. And I'm gonna go down and start searching here, which is basically no exploration at all. So one way of then thinking, okay, I know there's no noise in the function. So what I'm gonna add is noise. So if I add noise to this function, well, now I've done a different model mismatch. I have a wrong model in a different way. So now the model will end up saying, oh, great. I can actually explain all these variations that you've seen as noise. And now the green thing is the smoothest thing I've ever seen. Perfect. So now I can fit my prior really well, my GP prior. But this is also wrong. Right. And actually, if we go back to this, you can actually think of observing this point here is good for modeling the function, but it's really bad for finding the minima. So I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to just have one slice more. So this leads me to a question here of how we're actually thinking about this problem in general. So the way we drew this graph was that we said that we have designed this operator that picks us data which should be informative of the minima. But our algorithm is just trying to model the function. But we're not interested in modeling the function. We're interested in finding the minima of the function. So wouldn't it be better to say, actually, I'm going to design an algorithm that tries to model the location of the minima. So now if my model changes to not say, what's the model of the function, but what's the model of the location of the minima? Often you have this information. So say for example, I'm modeling a chemical process. I know that the process is periodic and I know something about the periodicity of these local minimas. I have no idea what the function looks in between. Can I use this to model instead? And actually you can. So here is taking that approach to this problem. Now I'm not longer trying to model the black function. I'm trying to model where I think the minima is of the black function. And what happens in this case is that it says that these points here are actually very uninformative of where the minima is. Now it therefore fits this function and gives me this acquisition. And I had a couple of more things, but I'm going to skip them and leave it at that. There is a worksheet where you get to test and implement these things. You can test with different functions. You can implement more acquisitions than we had as well. And I'm going to stop sharing there. Cool.